Thanks a lot. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And um, thanks to Helen Fennick for the invitation to take part in this long scheduled event. Um, today, I'm going to briefly run through research from my PhD, which I completed in 2019 on the impacts of natural disasters on populations in medieval Britain. In the past, just as today, when uh, really extreme events affected communities and settlements, there's little doubt that the effects could be sudden, severe and in the short term decisive, though their impact on settlements has been a matter of debate within medieval archaeology in the past. As Chris mentioned, I'm, I'm speaking to you today from, from the banks of the River Meuse, actually, or, or the Mass in Dutch, and uh, not too far upstream from here is the area in uh, Germany, the Netherlands and Belgium that was terribly affected by the really high magnitude floods that struck last July, which um, you probably remember seeing on the news. These floods destroyed large areas of settlements. Um, very sadly, over 100 people lost their lives, and the economic impact in the affected towns and wider regions was undoubtedly highly damaging. I was probably not alone in, in drawing comparisons with the Central European floods of 1342, which resulted in comparable levels of damage in, in Germany and neighbouring countries. In the case of last year's flood, though, the long term impact of such an event is not yet clear. Um, the sudden occurrence and uh, deadly outcome of, of these floods calls to mind another modern event, the, the North Sea floods of 1953. And while disasters are often dismissed as insignificant in the broader arc of history, uh, there's a frequently cited metaphor that disasters are like bees in that they, they sting and then they're dead, meaning that after the sudden shock, people quickly recover uh, and dis disasters don't generally determine how humans, human societies uh, develop over the long term. That's not quite true in the 1953 case. Uh, that flood provided the impetus for quite major developments like the uh, Delta Works flood defence scheme in the Netherlands and the Thames Barrier in the UK, which one could argue have had significant implications for the populations that live in these areas, at least for the 70 years or so since that flood occurred. In the next slides, I'm going to go through a variety of disasters that struck medieval Britain and the different kinds of impacts these events unleashed looking in particular at the kinds of responses that medieval communities typically rely upon in the face of these events and what, if any, their repercussions were. Um, to begin with, it's useful just to quickly highlight the hazards that typically face Britain. Uh, seismic hazard is low, as you can see from this map, blue is low, red is high. Um, though, as, as you'll know, there's usually at least one small scale earthquake every year that makes the news. And, it was the same in the medieval period. Uh, an earthquake in 1382 with an epicenter somewhere in the English Channel seems to have caused damage throughout southeast England, but such events were rare and usually relatively minor, especially when we think about some of the earthquakes that struck more seism seismically active regions during the medieval period, such as Italy or Switzerland. Th those really did transform settlements and landscapes. Um, in terms of flooding, we can see that at a European level today, um, southern England has a relatively high number of floods per basin, Though this is not a measure of how intense such floods were, the vast majority of these floods were probably relatively minor events that were more or less expected and planned for as part of the annual cycle. And embankments in areas that were frequently flooded would have been commonplace uh, when there were things that warranted protecting from these floods, such as agricultural land, settlement and uh, livestock could be moved to safety during the, the seasons when flooding was expected. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, we can we can see, and as as we've already heard, that uh, the North Sea coasts of Britain are at high risk of storm surges, and under the right weather conditions, low pressure systems that cause um, the water level to rise, uh, with winds forcing the water against the coast, can result in severe flooding in coastal settlements. And finally, a uh, winter storm. Uh, winter storm risk for which the whole of the British Isles is at risk. Uh, as it faces the full force of cyclonic systems blown in from the Atlantic. Uh, and by the way, uh, central Scotland and County Durham are just as exposed to these risks. It's just that they didn't report data in the, uh, the data set I used here. So as we all know, weather related hazards pose a significant hazard in Britain, both today and in the medieval period. All of these risks can be conceptualized as a cycle. Uh, this is a framework known as the disaster cycle, which breaks down each disaster into a series of sequ sequential stages before the event, the impact and after the event. And within that, the responses and activities of the affected populations. 
Every disaster is different and there's no set time frame over which these stages play out. Uh, but I think you can fit the impact of every disastrous event into these stages. Uh, ideally, of course, we hope that um, humans learn from the past and their responses in the mitigation stage improve so that the impact of repetitive events reduces over time. I want you to hold the idea of the disaster cycle in your mind and I'm going to return to it at the end. So I'm going to look at three case studies uh, three case study disasters in some detail. Uh, there's a lot to choose from that affected medieval British populations and uh, and settlements. So in a sense, this is an arbitrary selection, but there are uh, these are some of the few for which good evidence survives. Um, it might be something of a chance survival, but also probably relates to the fact that these were particularly severe and damaging events that have left behind significant traces in the historical and archaeological records. Uh, my first case study, we've also we've already touched on this morning, uh, is the floods and storms of 1287 and 1288. This appears to have been a series of winter storms that struck during the months of January 1287 and uh, December 1287 and February 1288. Uh, there was also a lesser event in the summer of 1288 that's reported in some chronicles. Uh, these events followed in quick succession and affected towns down the east coast and especially around the coasts of southern England. Uh, many of the ones that uh, Jill Draper discussed in the, the previous presentation, as well as uh, some towns in the Low Countries. Um, the dates given in the historical uh, sources that describe these storms are, are difficult to reconcile and they aren't all in agreement, but notably several of the dates which are reported in multiple sources match up very closely with uh, new or full moons, uh, which uh, I don't know, most people probably know that uh, at a new or a full moon that the tide is at its uh, maximum and so you're actually more at risk of a flood event uh, when that occurs. Um, so that would have ex exacerbated any flooding and it's a pattern actually that was almost exactly repeated in the 1953 floods that I already mentioned. Textual descriptions of these events uh, document the immediate reactions of those affected uh, who tried to climb trees, escape to high ground, animals were swept away or, or cut off on newly formed temporary islands, agricultural land was inundated, uh, crops were ruined of course. So some of, some of these events seem to have been really high magnitude and the fact that multiple inundations occurred in quick succession probably heightened the impact as, as flood defences would have been weakened or already disrupted meaning that uh, even lower severity floods could have damaging impacts if they occurred before there had been a chance to take uh, preventative measures uh, caused by the last flood. Um, archaeologically, a number of sites have been connect connected with this series of storms, but it is very difficult to link archaeological remains definitively with um, historically documented storms, since the dating is, uh, is really precise. Um, uh, really precise enough to exclude another earlier or later storm of which there are usually possible candidates. Uh, there are flood layers in, in Wisbeck and uh, Kings Lynn, for example, which are chronologically consistent with these storms, but they can't be linked definitively. Likewise, there's a number of deserted areas of medieval occupation and flood layers on the south coast of England, such as uh, North Eye in Sussex, which appears to have been severely affected uh, by storms in this period. And there are flood layers in Hastings and several assemblage, assemblages of medieval pottery at coastal sites that have been associated with this series of storms in the literature, though, as I say, there isn't definitive evidence. Um, New Romney in Kent, as we've already uh, heard this morning, is, is one of the areas with the best preserved evidence for storm damage. Uh, the area is documented as being affected in 1287 and 1288, but there was also an earlier phase of storm flooding here in the 1250s. Uh, I looked through all of the available grey literature for the town to map where uh, evidence of possible storm damage had been identified, uh, producing this map, which highlights the coastal frontage of, of the town, as Jill Draper already mentioned, I think, um, as the area worst affected. I should say that uh, significant geomorphological changes and embankments since the medieval period have changed the position of the coastline uh, significantly, and it's now several kilometres out to the east relative to where it would have been in the medieval period. Um, thinking about what these storms actually meant for settlement in the town, it's very difficult to say anything definitive. While going through the grey literature, I looked for evidence of continuous med medieval occupation, as well as uh, medieval abandonment or disruption, such as site clearance or reconstruction, 
to try and see if there was any spatial relationship between the areas affected by the storms and those that were abandoned. It does appear that there is a cluster in the town's southern area that may have been particularly disrupted as a result of the storms. But again, it's difficult to be sure if that was the cause. We, we also have to think about other factors, such as the general shift from arable pastoral farming in the region, which required uh, less manpower. Um, and shifting trade relationships with continental Europe that might have been responsible for these kinds of changes, uh, deep depopulation as economic trends shifted. In the end, it's impossible to be certain if storms were responsible for a disruption in the town, but we have to consider it as a factor. My second case study today comes from the marshland provinces, uh, provinces, I'm stuck in my Netherlands mode here, parishes of Norfolk. Uh, where we have uh, good documentation of flood events throughout the 13th and 14th centuries. These records come from the work of the antiquarian William Dugdale, who, who gathered together a wealth of historical evidence for the region in the 17th century. Um, using these records, it's possible to plot where and when flood events occurred in this period. And we can see that as well as the floods of the 1280s, the, the same events that I already spoke about, there's a particular cluster of floods in the 1330s. And I was, and of these, the flood of 1338 was the most severe, resulting in damage all along the coastal embankments of the marshland parishes. Those who lived in this area had to contribute financially or through providing labour to the maintenance and upkeep of the flood defence embankments that protected the area. And similar arrangements existed in other coastal areas, such as Romney Marsh. Um, the medieval flood defences that uh, can be traced on historical maps and using LIDAR, and we can see what are very probable, probably breaches in the flood defences, these semicircular bulges along the line of the embankment uh, that relate to subsequent repairs after the water had caused the breach. We don't know exactly when these specific uh, breaches occurred, but it's easy to imagine that after the flooding had subsided, the, the social system present in the region would have quickly kicked into action uh, and the local people would have come together to repair the damage to try and prevent another subsequent flood coming through the breach. Um, petitions to the king in the aftermath of the 1338 flood give acreages of land affected by flooding in each parish, as well as financial figures for the costs of repair. We can see that the reported figures are, re are really substantial. Uh, the figures are believable, but looking into this case in more detail reveals another aspect of how medieval populations responded to these disasters. Uh, the flood came during a new bout of war between England and Scotland, and to fund these wars, taxes worth a 15th of the value of movable goods were imposed in 1337, just the year prior to the flood. The 1338 floods in marshland led to an ongoing dispute because taxes continued to be calculated based on the pre-flood assessment of movable goods. Though as the inhabitants of marshland argued, many of these goods had been destroyed in the flood. So in their petition to the king, it may have been advantageous to emphasize the great destruction that had been caused to try and uh, reduce their tax bill. And they did eventually get it sorted out, but uh, it was a, a process that went on for a number of years before they managed to get a their taxes recalculated. Um, for my final case study, I'm going to look at the extreme windstorm of 1362, which blew across Ireland and uh, the British Isles on the night of um, 15th of January 1362. We know that after it blew across Britain, it continued across the North Sea to Germany and Denmark, uh, very similar to the track of the 2013 St Jude's storm. Uh, that's not one that's gone down particularly in the collective memory of the British population, I think, but I, I remember the wheelie bins getting blown over in Durham. Um, along the German and Danish coasts, the 1362 storm caused significant coastal flooding. There's been some archaeological work on the German islands in Schleswig-Holstein, which has uncovered evidence for medieval settlement that seems to have been abandoned at the time of the storm. And indeed, this storm is associated with a massive loss of life documented in the historical record, though how, how reliable these accounts are is, is highly debatable. In Britain, there isn't so much evidence for coastal flooding as a result of this storm. It's often associated with the abandonment of, of Raven's Rod that we uh, was mentioned earlier by David Griffiths. But the historical evidence that I'm aware of suggests that town was uh, abandoned uh, prior to the occurrence of this storm. Uh, so just to briefly run through the evidence uh, for areas where damage occurred, we can see that a large swathe of southern England was affected by the storm of 1362. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember the famous 1987 storm, this seems to have been a relatively similar event. Uh, we have reports of large numbers of trees being felled, as well as damage to a lot of church towers. 
Um, the evidence comes in different forms. Most is documentary describing storm damage at specific locations, though in a few cases it's possible to link indicators of structural damage or repairs, including dendro dendrochronological dates from timbers with documented damage. As with the floods I mentioned already, it's again difficult to link archaeological evidence for damage to this specific storm in the absence of a documentary account, because, of course, the damage could have been caused by another storm or another type of event entirely. Looking at the density of the known damage, we can see that it clusters roughly around London and the southeast, with only sporadic damage reported in places like Cornwall and Ireland, none at all known from Wales, as far as I'm aware. This is probably a reflection of two related factors. Uh, number one, damage to human settlements was more likely to occur in areas that were densely populated because there was more settlement there. And it was more likely to be reported in these areas as well, just simply because there were more people and more chance of uh, surviving uh, evidence, evidence surviving into the modern period. Um, oh, sorry. I sh my mouse wheel back in there. <laughs> um, yeah, looking at a plot of population for England derived from the poll tax return of 1377, just uh, over a decade after the storm, we can see that there's some level of correlation between the density of population and the areas where we know damage occurred. So there's a very, very likely some level of bias in the pattern that the available evidence shows. In the aftermath of the storm, we have all kinds of documentary evidence for the way contemporary society reacted, the prices that tilers and thatchers could charge uh, to carry out uh, roof repairs was regulated to prevent them inflating their prices and taking advantage of the storm. We see some landowners selling off timber that had been felled by the storm, and there is evidence of repairs being carried out in churches and other structures that have been damaged. That sometimes took many years to uh, actually be carried out. I have I've written a paper that goes into much more detail on this storm, so uh, I can direct you to that if uh, if you'd like to know more. So hopefully here I've been able to demonstrate some examples of the kinds of events that populations and settlements faced during the medieval period, as well as the difficulties in reconstructing these events and actually being able to say how they played out both over the uh, short, medium and long terms. Um, I know this is the settlement research group, and so maybe uh, artifacts are. are Less of, of less interest, but uh, moving away from specific disasters, I want to think a little bit about how medieval people perceived these events and, and what they could do to protect themselves. Of course, against floods, there were some relatively obvious protections. <clears throat> you can build dikes and embankments to protect your lands and settlements from rising water, but that needs to be planned in advance. Uh, throwing up a flood defence at short notice would have been quite difficult in the medieval period. And against storms and storm surges, uh, these were inherently unpredictable events, um, and so you had much less obvious practical responses available. So for medieval people in Britain, uh, who had generally been brought up as Christian, there were some obvious responses available to them. Prayer to the saints as intercessors was widely believed to be a way that medieval people could protect themselves when they were exposed to great danger in any form, uh, not just disasters, things like childbirth, disease, or before a battle. <clears throat> a prayer then would have been a natural response for medieval communities when disasters arose. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and these are manifest through things like folded coins, which we, we know through documentary evidence were folded as part of a ritual in which you made a vow with a saint for protection in the moment. <clears throat> and it's easy to imagine medieval people turning to this kind of response uh, when the kinds of disasters I've spoken about today occurred. Uh, there's plenty of records also of church bells being rung to ward off storms. <clears throat> which were thought to be caused by, oh, sorry, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah, church bells being rung to ward off storms um, because uh, storms were believed to be caused by airborne demons that could be repelled by the ringing of these bells. And graffiti such as those of ships probably represent another kind of prayer, perhaps either by the sailors themselves to protect, to protect themselves during a voyage or by a family member to to offer some protection to somebody who was away at sea. So the effectiveness of these kinds of responses uh, could never be disproved for medieval people because storms or floods always pass eventually. So you could you could argue that your folding of the coin was the thing that made it made it uh, go away. Um, so going back to the disaster cycle, I I've slotted in here the evidence from the three case studies that I've briefly looked at here today. 
And we can see that medieval people really had quite a lot of responses open to them during the restoration, reconstruction and quiescence phases. The damage may have been significant, but people were usually well able to pull, pull things back together, uh, repair what had been damaged. And in some cases, we do see preparations such as the strengthening of flood defences in anticipation that more severe floods could come in the future. Or in some uh, cathedrals and church buildings, we, we can see arch architectural evidence for repairs that look to have tried to not just replace what had been damaged, but to ensure that that kind of damage didn't happen again. Uh, for example, uh, some uh, buttresses were enlarged to support towers that had been damaged. Uh, uh, and in the, inside um, the spire of Salisbury Cathedral, for example, following the storm of 1362, an internal scaffold was inserted, which may have aimed to support the spire, to hold it together, uh, to stop um, similar storm damage occurring in the future. <clears throat> As we saw in the case of the floods in marshland, there was also a level of financial and administrative planning that took place in the aftermath of these disasters uh, that uh, communities could attempt to exploit to try to mitigate the impact of events such as floods. And in some cases, the Crown and its representatives did intervene to try to prevent populations being too badly affected. Uh, in the aftermath of the 1362 storm, for example, the Exchequer seems to have been more willing than usual to forgive outstanding debts perhaps as it recognised the difficulties the storm had posed for affected populations. So there were generally plenty of things medieval po uh, populations could do in the aftermath and in the periods between the occurrence of disasters. They were far from helpless and often they did take action uh, where they recognised the risk was present. It's during the short term, the moments of disaster, when rapid onset disasters were actually occurring, that they were much more vulnerable. And that's actually not so different today. Although our emergency services are much more advanced than medieval analogues, and we have somewhat more sophisticated uh, weather forecasting, which usually gives some warning that an extreme event is likely to occur. To plug this gap, therefore, medieval people turned to something that seemed logical to them, uh, religious and superstitious responses, responses, such as prayer and ritual artifacts, such as the folding of coins. It's easy to think of this now as a backward response to natural disasters, uh, but you have to understand that throughout their whole lives, medieval people were exposed to stories about how the saints intervened, intervened to help people. Uh, church sermons were full of stories about natural disasters and how the saints exerted control over them. And there are a lot of superstitions about how different practices, materials and objects could offer protection from various hazards. Um, so if we look at the disaster cycle in the round, we can see that medieval people were in fact prepared, at least in their own minds, for every stage of the cycle. Though in practical terms, they were relatively helpless during the moments of disaster when extreme conditions such as the various floods and storms I've talked about today actually struck. It was logical for medieval populations to turn to religious and superstitious practices in these times of need, and they may not have actually felt helpless, as, as these were courses of action which they believed to be effective. My distinction of practical and religious superstitious responses here uh, may not be a distinction that medieval people themselves recognised. And I know of at least one example from the Netherlands in which they, there appear to have been ritual de depositions of cauldrons within the body of 14th century flood embankments, which seems to indicate that practice, practical solutions alone were not always seen as sufficient precautions and that their efficacy could be enhanced through re, uh, ritual acts such as depositions. And we should also think about processes that haven't left a significant uh, material signature. For example, annual rogation ceremonies in which relics might have been processed through settlements and blessings might have taken place to protect crops and bolster the protective power of, of things like flood defences. So while in the most extreme disasters, when entire settlements were destroyed or swept away, such as in the example of uh, Forvi, uh, which seems to have been covered over by sand in a single night, as uh, David Griffiths mentioned, Medieval people had little choice but to abandon the settlement. In most cases, though, recovery was perfectly possible. Practical solutions to problems existed and were well understood. And the short term dangers could be protected against, at least within the medieval worldview, through resort to uh, religious and superstitious practices. So thanks a lot for listening. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. And again, if you'd like more detail about any of these events I've mentioned today, I, I can try to point you towards uh, the relevant literature. So thanks a lot.